Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories. All before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 13 of the Tomato Timer. And today we have with us, joining us, Emily Reed. Emily is a PhD candidate at the Wellcome Trust Cell Therapies and Regenerative Medicine Program at King's College London. So it's a combination. She did her undergraduate in biology at Imperial College London and was also part of a program. She did a, a year in re- as a research scientist at GlaxoSmithKline. And she's this amazing advocate for STEM education. She's been engaged with young people at the Evelina Youth Hospital Inspiring Youth Conference. And she also got a public engagement grant to run a summer course for A-level students going to STEM. Emily, it's a pleasure for us to have you today. How are you? Hi, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Good. Um, yeah, it's we have a, a plethora of questions for you. Um, Excellent. But I wanted to start off, uh, first off, with what you're doing right now. What's your current research about? Um, so I am, as you've mentioned, I'm doing a PhD um, and the title of the programme is Cell Therapies and Regenerative Medicine. Um, but specifically mm-hmm. in my project, I'm using this incredible system called organoids, um, which sounds very science fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> but essentially, we're taking stem cells and growing them in a dish. And in my project, I'm using that as a model to understand inflammatory bowel disease. Mm. And specifically looking at how the immune system and the bacteria interact in our gut and how this is potentially disrupted in inflammatory bowel disease. We want to learn a lot more about your research and stem cell therapy and all that kind of stuff in general. But before we get into that, I wanted to take you back in time a bit and ask you when you were back at school, mm-hmm. how did you actually end up um, deciding to study something so pure as biology? Um, and what was that kind of inspiration to get into STEM? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a strange journey because it starts off, I was, I was always very interested in kind of biology and I loved watching David Attenborough documentaries as a kid. Um, so, yeah. and, you know, kind of the outside world I'd always found very fascinating. Um, yeah. And then kind of when deciding to do GCSEs and A-levels, I knew that I really liked science. Um, and I had some very good advice kind of quite early on when deciding about what to study at university which was um because I you know I'd always had this fascination and love for animals and I thought okay maybe I could do zoology at uni maybe I want to be a vet um Mm -hmm. but the advice I had was actually to kind of start broad and then specialize later um so I started off doing biology and then during my first year of university doing biology I was like oh no you have to be good at maths to do zoology and I'm not very good at maths <laughs> so <laughs> then I kind of and then this kind of interest in the more kind of cell biology and particularly I found really interesting how there are these cells in our body that can you know do this incredible regeneration of parts of our bodies just every day when we're injured um, so that's how it kind of evolved into a more specific interest in stem cells yeah so and what about your year in research when you were at um, GSK how was that did that kind of push you in a certain direction did it open up another mindset yeah so definitely so um, it was always something I knew I wanted to do have a year outside of my degree working because I think it's really important just to get experience doing anything um, and experience in industry is is a great thing to do it opens up lots of opportunities um and for me it was just kind of the experience of being in the lab day to day because when you're doing your degree a lot of your time is spent in lectures you're learning about the theory of biology but having the opportunity to go out and actually apply that in the lab was was quite eye-opening definitely yeah and one of the questions we had was what is your advice for those of us considering work integrated courses at university Yes, so at university, absolutely. I've, I've, everyone who I know that's done it has had a had a pretty good experience, um, and it it can be really informative for lots of reasons. So not only can it help you kind of inspire you for what you want to do and what you want to try, but also it can help you decide. Oh, actually, maybe some things aren't necessarily for me. So, for example, I loved being in the lab and I loved mm-hmm. that whole environment, but I didn't want to work for. It helped me kind of understand that I didn't want to work for a big pharma company like GSK um so it's kind of a really good experience for 
eliminating and finding out what you do and you don't like. Yeah, that's really cool because um, it, it not only told you what to pursue, but also what not to pursue. Yeah, I think that's just as valuable <laughs> as figuring out what you actually. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the opportunities are endless and the, the options are endless. So figuring out what does and doesn't work for you is is just the most important part of the journey, really. Yeah. Could you, um, as a as a give a layman explanation of what stem cells are and how they work and yeah yeah a bit more about that yeah absolutely yeah so stem cells are a very interesting type of cell um and what they can do which is makes them very special is that when they divide they can create more of themselves but also they can go on and develop to become different types of specialized cell Mm -hmm. um so In the adult human body, there are lots of different types of stem cells that live in their particular organ. So there's the skin is always a good example. Um, So there's lots of um, stem cells present in your skin. And then when you're into your skin or just in the day to day kind of shedding of your skin, these stem cells are able to divide not only to um, maintain their population, but then also to differentiate and become very specialized skin cells that do you know, the fantastic job of keeping out, you know, the external environment. So Mm -hmm. that's what makes them kind of special. Super cool. Um, And uh, there's a lot of um, kind of interest because of their almost um, supernatural quality in the sense that they just turn into anything you want them to be. Um, There's a kind of questions regarding, you know, uh, can we have like total organ replacement using stem cells? And have you in your research seen or heard about that? Yeah, so so the that's the thing that makes them kind of very interesting from a therapeutic standpoint is this, oh, if they can become anything, we can push them to become, you know, an entire and another entire organ. Yeah. Um but I think it's it's important to kind of bear in mind some of the inherent restrictions of stem cells because there's a lot of hype, especially in the media, about kind of stem cells as this wonderful silver bullet for almost every single disease, um, which isn't the case. Um, so in yeah. biology, the stem cells that we have in our body are restricted. So they're mostly able to differentiate or become a certain type of cell or a certain small specialized subtype of cells. So the problem with thinking about an entire regenerating an entire limb, for example, there's lots of different types of tissue. Um, so it's very, very complicated when you're looking at something kind of on that scale. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Um, because, yeah, we, we do hear in the media something that's it, it sounds as if it's going to you know, solve every problem there is. But obviously, so what would the specific challenges be of using stem cells in any kind of uh, treatment or therapeutic? So I think one of, yeah, one of the things that, that we are still figuring out which is really really crucial is when stem cells live in the body they're surrounded and supported by something that we call the stem cell niche and this is basically the kind of environment surrounding the stem cell Mm -hmm. that gives it directions tells it what to do maintains it in its stem-like state Um, and understanding those signals and those cues that tell that stem cell how to behave is really really important because obviously when we are thinking about using stem cells for therapy we're taking the stem cells outside of that little niche that they have of everything that supports them putting them into a completely different environment potentially a completely different diseased environment yeah so you know maintaining that stem like state and getting it to do what we want it to do is something which is incredibly difficult very cool um i wanted to kind of take it a bit um more generalized and, and regarding media and, and also like the global opinion about um, stem cell research and yeah. I guess the ethical implications of it all. What What, what is it like right now? Um, we hear a lot of kind of things on the media saying that people are supporting it and people are also very heavily against it. And how does it affect you as a scientist, as a researcher? Yeah, no, that's a really, really interesting point. Um, so kind of speaking generally about you know, the kind of world opinion of stem cells. As you say, there's there's this whole spectrum of, of how people feel about stem cells. Um, and I think on the one hand, people are very keen for their application for the treatment of certain diseases. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a very good and positive thing. However, people are obviously concerned about how they could potentially be used um, 
for ill and you know it's it's a similar problem with when people think about genetic editing and you know there's the positive side of yeah you know we can potentially cure all these genetic diseases but then there's always the concern of the designer babies and that kind of um potential negative impacts of developing this technology i think that for stem cells there's a lot in the uk anyway of regulations surrounding how you can develop and use them for therapy um Mm -hmm. the situation is slightly different in the states and that's led to a few quite um dodgy kind of stem cell clinics that are making claims that are relatively scientifically unfounded yeah um so it varies where you are i think in the globe um and as for me as a researcher we've we've always throughout my education i've had very good modules on ethics and the ethical implications of what we do mm-hmm. and kind of just having that discussion has always been something that's been part of my kind of education which is which is really important yeah i want you to draw an analogy that we had on an episode uh, just last week um where our guest was talking about technology policies and things like ai and 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 it's it's strange that you know we're talking about something that's very <laughs> like you know two different spectrums completely technology and science and yet there were the similar kind of yeah yeah i guess issues and and challenges highlighted by both and one of the things that was really um like quite critical and it, uh, it really gave me a good point to think about was the fact that we don't even know what we're looking at the research is so far ahead that sometimes policy makers don't exactly know what what they're writing about or what policy they need to kind of shape and does that is that uh, something that's also specific to stem cell research as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really, really good, really good analogy that there's, you know, it's across the field in lots of different, you know, STEM subjects is that the rate of change in terms of research is so rapid. We're discovering such incredible things at such a fast rate. And there is a delay when it comes to how that's implemented in policy and how that's regulated in policy. Mm. Um, And, there are things that are being done to challenge that. So we're encouraged to um, take an internship during our our PhD. And one option for that is to go and work in policy. Um, So I think just kind of building those bridges between scientists and government is is crucial. Yeah. Um, And there's lots of work being done around that, but it's, it's, again, it's just the pace is so quick, um, which is, which is where the danger lies. Absolutely. And a a bit more of a, not specific to stem cell but just as a scientist yourself obviously when we are trying to solve a problem there is a level of modeling required there's a level of kind of making assumptions and setting out certain kind of you know this is what we're going to be solving because obviously we can't take into consideration everything the whole environment around us um so when you are kind of creating these like how do you get that balance between um making that scientific lab laboratory test um, and then taking that into the real life situation? And how do you find that balance of, you know, that's a good enough model to use? Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a really, really good point. And anybody working in kind of biomedicine or biosciences will come up against this. Um, we can only work with the tools and the models that we have. Um, and I think mm-hmm. one thing that's fantastic in science is, the collaboration between different groups and between people using different models. So for us, uh, the model that that we're that we're using this stem cell based organoid model is fantastic at um, when you want to look into really nitty gritty kind of pathways, things that are really hard to determine when looking at you know kind of genome whole genome association studies or when you're looking at animal models. But doesn't mean that they don't complement each other. So obviously if you validate something in one model, it's then really important to go and test it in as many other models as you possibly can to make sure that it holds true. Um, of course. You know, in, in multiple different models and it's not just an artifact of, of what of the model that you're particularly working with. Yeah. Well, Emily, you're absolutely a like an inspiration and like so far ahead, you're like, a, you're like an idol for us in terms of going through like STEM and getting not just through your undergraduate, but then graduate and doing your PhD. Um, but how would you say it was best for us, especially if we were thinking of going to these kind of career pathways, whether it's research or even um, in corporate, um, how do we develop our interests and how do we efficiently search for opportunities to further our interests? 
Yeah, it's it's a really good point because I, I, it's hard when there's so many opportunities kind of in a sense now, you know, with, with the resources that lots of people have available, it's really hard to kind of sift through and, and figure out what's, you know, where to spend your time and what to invest your time doing. Yeah, I think um, if there is something that you are interested in a specific area of, of science or whatever it is, then following that up um, is is incredibly important outside of what you, you know, what you normally study, if it's biology, for example, you know, f- finding ways to engage in biology outside of just your A-levels or GCSEs. Um, so there are universities often run kind of courses aimed at A-level and GCSE students. So King's has a kind of King's Stars course, which is mm-hmm. great for getting involved in medicine, dentistry, scientific research. Um, I think signing up to, although it sounds very lame, but signing up to some mailing list as well, because then they just come through and um, you can see events going on around you. For example, Nature Journals has a has a mailing list and they display certain events that are local to your area yeah so figuring it finding sifting through some of that stuff although it does take time I think it's worth doing um because it just can help you kind of develop your interest and and figure out what you do and don't like and it's obviously great for applications looking at university absolutely and what is there's a kind of strange myth around well it's not specifically biology but medical courses and and STEM in general that you know they're super exhausting and you have to overwork and you you're kind of in this kind of state of almost burnout what 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 did you feel about your undergraduate journey and now even at at research level yeah i i think it's a really really good thing to talk about and for people to be open about because it is it, it can be exhausting doing um you know a degree and doing a phd and i think It's true for degrees in lots of subjects, not just medicine and biology, but, you know, many, many subjects. Um, When you get to university level, it does become very stressful. Um, But just being aware of what support is available to you. Uh, Most universities have very good um, support for when you're struggling, if you have problems with mental health. Um, There's often a lot of support that is available. yeah, and I think it, being aware as well that 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 often these things, yeah, there are times of a PhD or a degree which are incredibly stressful, but there are times which are also amazing fun, um, and it's it's a balance between the two, definitely. Absolutely. And personally, did you ever feel a time when it was um, either a super exciting time or a time where you were you you know completely lost interest in what you were studying, and and how did it how did you get back on track on that on that kind of situation? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, so in for kind of most recently during a PhD, a lot of scientific research is is failure, which is something that you have to get used to quite quickly um, because it's about doing experiments, trying things out. And often those things don't work. Um, So it's almost it's almost a kind of shift in how you view failure, I think, is really important. And you no longer take it as a kind of a personal hit on oh well I'm rubbish I'm terrible I can't do this experiment. Mm. It's more kind of okay well I tried that it didn't work. Now let's try something else. And you know it can you can if you can reframe it to become a positive thing. I think that's a really useful skill. Yeah. Um, for studying anything. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like almost like a a mindset um, shift. It's almost like trying to think about um, the situation you're in and trying to like. Um, it maybe fool yourself into thinking, making it into positive, but definitely making your kind of how you're framing the problem and how you're seeing the, the result of it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's so much is about kind of how you're able to frame situations in your head, and and you know it's the same for when I remember periods when studying for A levels or GCSEs or degree when you're in those really yeah. deep, heavy periods of revision, and you know you haven't left your room for days and you feel gross, um, but just kind of remembering that that's a temporary situation and that if you're able to push through it and and work to the best of your ability at this time then in a few months a few weeks however long it is you'll have done that exam and the sense of relief and and kind of just bearing that in mind that that situation is is temporary yeah so tell us a little bit about how you've got so so deeply engaged in kind of stem engagement and how you've um like been involved with so many activities 
with through your university time and and later on as well um tell us a little bit about what what inspired you to get here yeah i th- i think it was um again it's kind of been a journey um from just figuring out that that i wanted to do biology and and really enjoying doing biology and just wanting to make sure that everyone who wanted to be involved in a stem subject you know had the opportunity to i think i've i, I think it's important that people are able to explore these options if if they want to um and i was lucky to be surrounded by people and kings particularly have been very good at kind of supporting engagement and outreach as part of your degree uh, the welcome trust they also are very encouraging on getting students to go out and do things and support outreach and engagement activities because they really see the value in it which i think is is very good definitely mm. inspiring the next generation it, it definitely yeah, makes more it, sense it's, it's so important it's so important for so many different reasons yeah so um well another question that is kind of goes away from stem cell research but something that i read in your bio and was quite interested about was um your work in the science media center um especially yes, around yeah. the initial news of the coronavirus outbreak and how you're supporting the journalists and was, tell us a little about about that yeah that was that was really exciting so the um the science media center is a charity that's based in the welcome trust building which is in north london um mm-hmm. And so the work that they do is that they work with scientists and journalists to try and dispel scientific misinformation. Um, so they try and make sure that scientific stories are reported properly in the media, um, which I think is is very valuable. Yeah. Um, and so they they hold kind of these press briefings where they invite scientists who are specialists in their subject to talk about a particular thing or something that's happening in the media at the minute um and so they held one of these in so I was working in the science media center for a month as an intern supporting them in getting these events together and and kind of doing their day-to-day running and one of the briefings we held was with um Neil Ferguson who's an incredible uh, scientist at Imperial um and a few other scientists as well just as the kind of coronavirus outbreak was happening in in January the early stages of it yeah and it was just amazing having a room packed full of journalists and these scientists it was just very and a very exciting day um you know and then thinking about the longer term impact absolutely and it's super um well really helpful to hear and to, to know that there are organizations and people trying to work on as you said dispelling misinformation because um I'm sure we've all been uh like put, <laughs> every piece of news in fact has been like shoved down our throats these days about some strange uh statistic or something like that or some and it's it's yeah. scary because we don't know what's true and what's not. I mean it's it's absolutely true especially I think it's brought to light by things like the current situation that we're in with coronavirus where there's so much kind of conflicting information about what's going on and what's the best advice for example with masks is it worth wearing them is it not worth wearing them um that it's very easy to to kind of lose sight of what we actually do know and what we actually don't know um and i think it's important to just to to to, to be able to read things critically and to you know fact check as often as you can um mm. because there is so much out there that is false <laughs> yeah disinformation fake news yeah exactly yeah 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 um i wanted to ask uh, uh kind of round it off because we do have very limited time and we would love to have had you for much longer but it's also good to keep us in check and in focus um what's what's your, what are your opinions on the kind of the broader biotech field and and if it's in specific through your stem perspective but how do you see it growing and what what are your opinions on it So the I think the biotech field is rapidly expanding especially in the UK. Um it's something crazy like it's grown by 65% since 2016 or something. So it's it's wow. a really exciting field to be in. Um and there's lots of opportunities there um in lots of different kind of parts of biotech. Mm-hmm. And it's nice as it's not just localized to London, we're seeing it in other cities and other parts of the UK which is great. Um so 
yeah and we always our, our lecturers always said to us you know we've had the technology revolution now it's time for the biology revolution <laughs> so yeah so yeah I think it's a, it's a great time to if you're if you are interested in in science and biology it's a great time to kind of develop those interests and think about it as a career potentially yeah there was another question which started almost sci-fi so I kept it right till the end what about yeah. uh, nanotechnology and nanobots what, how would they be uh, involved and could they be implemented in in kind of stem cell uh, implementation and stuff yeah it's a really a really interesting question so it's not it's not I haven't heard much about nanobots it's not my particular area but from what I mm-hmm. know of them they seem like a really cool technology that could be used in lots of different therapies particularly cancer i think um for targeting drugs to cancer yeah i think they have some limitations um especially when we're thinking about stem cells again it's it's kind of getting making sure that they're delivering the cells to where they need to be making sure that when the cells are there they're behaving in the way that we want them to behave yeah um so i think yeah it's it's a kind of watch this space really Mm. sounds really interesting so um final piece of advice to our students final piece of advice um i think this my my advice would be just explore as many things as you can um keep an open mind and yeah just take up any opportunities that you're able to because it's the best way to kind of develop yourself figure out what you do and you don't like um and, you know, if you ever are having problems with burnout or you're feeling overwhelmed, just make sure that you you kind of are aware of the support that's around you and, and make sure that you look for it because it's an exciting place to be in <laughs> STEM and biology. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, as many people get involved as possible is amazing. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being with us, Emily. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for joining us live. And we will be back with another episode on Saturday. So, yeah. Thank you. Bye for now. And that's another episode of The Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.